Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, interaction of atmospheric cold pools with uh, mean flow. Uh, so this work was done in collaboration with uh, Professor Joe, Joe Fernando's group from University of Notre Dame. Uh, uh, and one of the PhD scholars, Ed, Edgar Gonzalez, and uh, his postdoc, Jayesh Fartare. Um, so before I move into the crux of the talk, just wanted to give a motivation for this particular uh, study, uh, which stems from the field experiments, which were done during the 2018-19 field campaign in the Bay of Bengal. Um, so the ship track is shown here. The ship started from Sri Lanka and did a uh, routing <coughs> across the Bay of Bengal. And during that routing, what they observed was um, a sudden drop in air temperature, uh, which was greater than 5 degrees Celsius in a span of few minutes, followed by gusty winds. And this, this is that particular uh, event. And that's, uh, that's categorized as a cold pool event because there is a sudden air drop in air temperature. Uh, and then there is intense clouding uh, followed, by, followed by the air, drop temperature, uh, the air temperature drop. Uh, that leads to massive blockage of sunlight, so reducing the short wave radiation. And uh, there was also an intense rainfall activity for a very short period. And the precipitation, if you look at the black line, the, the precipitation rate is as, as high as 70 millimeter per hour. Uh, so this was the motivation for studying the cold pool interaction with mean flow. And similar uh, atmospheric cold pool events have been documented in literature. Uh, most recently by Sosa et al. Uh, in uh, Journal, Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. So this is not something new, but we are just looking into the dynamics of what happens when the cold pool interacts with the mean flow. So uh, to those who know what is a cold pool, uh, but to those who, do, who, who don't know what it, what it is, it is basically a cold air downdraft, uh, which could be an isolated pocket or a multiple isolated pockets which come together leading to a large scale system. Uh, and uh, descending downwards from, <coughs> from the upper atmosphere, hitting the ground, moving out as an outflow, and could trigger secondary storm, uh, secondary cloud convection. So uh, these are usually observed during deep convection in mesoscale cloud system. That is the that is a trigger for a atmospheric cold pool event. And as I already mentioned, the, they uh, cause an in increase in the wind speed and drop in the air temperature. And that's how they are identified in observations. If the air temperature drop is greater than five degrees then uh, that's, that's, that's categorized as a cold pool event. And once these cold pools form, then they can sustain for a few hours, leading to new localized cloud systems around the main system. So you have a main system, which is an isolated pocket of cold air or a multiple isolated pocket. Around that system, you will have many more localized cloud systems, which is, which is what is important, because they can give intense rain for a very short period of time. So that's what we are interested in understanding, how these secondary cloud systems form around the main system. So uh, <coughs> a typical genesis of atmospheric cold pool is, is, is given here, which is adapted, adapted from Mueller and Abramian. Uh, so you have a thermal convection at the surface, which, which allows the, uh, the air parcel to cross the LFC, which is the level of free convection. Once it crosses the level of free, free, free convection, then it is buoyant, so it can keep rising upwards. Condense and, condense and then uh, form an annual cloud and start moving, uh, at the, start spreading at the equilibrium level. Uh, so th after that, there are two mechanisms, probable mechanisms by which cold air downdraft can occur once this mesoscale cloud system has formed. One of them is a short-lived microburst where the, now the annual cloud system can enter in moist uh, air and it can lead to a blob of cold air moving downwards in form of a thermal. So a thermal is a most is, is kind of an intermittent phenomenon where you have a blob of cold air which is coming down, hitting the ground and creating an outflow. But those are very small scale systems, like the thermal is a very small scale system of the order of one kilometer and they don't sustain very, for a very long time. So that's not a probable mechanism to give a large scale ACP. Uh, ACP is the atmospheric cold pool. Okay. So what is the other mechanism? The other mechanism is as this annual cloud forms and there is ice particles and there are rain droplets inside the cloud. So there is going to be a phase change in the form of evaporation of rain droplets or melting of ice. So as soon as that happens, the surrounding air cools and it slumps down, it comes down as a cold air downdraft and it hits the ground and spreads as a gravity current. 
and that gravity current can interact with the oncoming mean flow and, res and result in a secondary cloud formation. So this is the mechanism which we are interested in probing uh, because this is what is a mesoscale system which can be as large as 30, 40 kilometers and it can sustain for a longer period of time giving rise to these secondary cloud systems that we are talking about. So this is, this is the uh, mechanism which we are interested in and the other reason we are interested in this mechanism is because this is much more sustained because this acts as a sustained plume now. It's a distributed plume source at, at the top which keeps feeding this cold air downdrafts and which gives the gravity current its energy to propagate outwards. So this is the most probable mechanism which can lead to the secondary cloud formation and that's, that's, that's the focus of this talk today. Uh, so what is the, the structure of this particular uh, cold pool and the gravity current? It's as follows. So from a source site of Z0, where the melting and evaporation uh, is initiated, which could be at a height of five, as, <coughs> it could be any height from the ground, typically five, six kilometers. So the cold air comes down. As it comes down, the, it hits the ground and it's, it uh, generates a gravity current, which has a depth of h, small h. As the gravity current is moving, it has a, a frontal velocity of uf. There are also some frontal instabilities uh, along the front of the gravity current. Of course, there is entrainment. But then the most important aspect is there is warm air which is flowing from this side. So there is a, the, the, the cold air gravity current is moving in the positive x direction, but then there is a warm air moving in the neg negative x direction. They somehow collide and it can lead to an updraft. Okay. And that updraft scale is what is important. So what is the velocity of the updraft and what is the height of the updrafts? So can the updraft reach LFC so that it can allow the uh, secondary cloud formation? That's the question that we are posing. All right. Is the updraft good enough? If, if, is the updraft given by this mechanical forcing, is it good enough to create a secondary cloud convection? So what are the circumstances for updraft, uh, updraft of warm air to happen as the cold air is undercutting the warm air? And what are the scales that we have? Can we come up with some scales of scales for the velocity of updraft and the height of these updrafts that, that we have seen uh, during these ACP events? Uh, so I go back to the, <coughs> the field campaign the, uh, because I just wanted to, we, we, we use the field campaign as a, a setup for, building, for our experimental parameters. So that's why we are, we are taking some, some information from the field and trying to set up the, the experiments in the lab. So this is the two, 2019 field campaign, which I already talked about. So now the, the cold pool event is in a little bit more uh, uh, magnified uh, form. Uh, so, the que so the question we're asking is, could the precipitation be triggered by the mechanical lifting at the front, uh, front of the cold pool? That's the, that's the question we are posing. So one of the issues with this particular data set is that we have only the surface uh, values of air temperature. Uh, we don't have anything above the ground. So at what is happening above the ground is what is triggering this cold pool. Like for instance, what is the buoyancy flux at the source, Z0? What is the velocity at, of, the, of the frontal gravity current? What is the velocity of the mean flow? Those informations are not, were not recorded during this particular field campaign. So we had to resort to another field campaign. Uh, before I move to that, this is, this is the, uh, the LIDAR data and the coilometer showing that there is indeed a gust and there is also uh, uh, cloud formation during the ACP event. So ACP events are characterized by strong gust, drop in temperature and cloud, localized cloud formation. But this particular field campaign is not useful for our experimental validation. So we took another uh, field campaign where aircraft drop sounds were released uh, at three different locations uh, across this cloud system. So this is the main cloud system. So at the cloud, uh, center of the cloud, rear of the cloud and front of the cloud, three drop sounds were released. They were measuring the vertical temperature structure and the vertical velocity structure. So once we have the vertical temperature and velocity structure, we can get the parameter. So we can, we know that what is the source site at which melting occurs, right? Or the evaporation of raindrop occurs. That's around five, five kilometers. The cold pool height is around four, 400 meters. Uh, the cold pool speed is around four meters per second. And the mean speed of the incoming flow, which is the background flow is around five meters per second. So now the question is, what would be the updraft height and what would be the updraft velocity for these kind of source conditions? That's what we are trying to find out. Uh, so the data set, this particular data set will be used for our experimental validation. 
The, so more uh, details are given in this paper. So <clears throat> the hypothesis which we started was as follows. Can the atmospheric cold pool act as a ramp for updraft? That's the, that's, that's the premise at way on, on which this entire study lies. So this is a schematic where we have already talked about this, where there is melting and evaporation and the cold pool is generated. It moves as a gravity current with a frontal speed of uf. The height of the gravity current is small h. Now you have an incoming mean flow, which can either be parabolic or inverse parabolic. And there are two uh, criterion. One of them is delta b is the buoyancy of the source. So if our delta b is the buoyancy between the front, so between the cold pool and the warm air uh, gradient. So if delta b is much, much less than the shear, then what will happen is the shear will simply override the cold pool and there is no updraft that can happen. But then there is a, there is this b is the most important aspect where if delta b is much, much greater than delta u square, uh, so if the buoyancy is enough to overcome the shear, then what you have is a stagnation point wherein you can create a two dipole, stru uh, a dipole structure uh, moving in uh, different directions and that will stagnate the cold pool and, the, and allow for updraft triggering secondary cloud convection or secondary cloud formation, I'm sorry, right? So the thing is the shear blocks the spread of ACP from its origin. So the ACP is not able to move, so that it stagnates. And now the ACP is acting as a ramp for the warm air to move upwards. And there is this two double dipole structure which produces entrainment and also allows the updraft to happen uh, uh, in a much more, uh, in, in a manner which can trigger secondary clouds, secondary cloud formation. So the important para aspect is, what is the strength of delta B to delta U square, which can be casted in the form of Richardson number. So that's what exactly we are doing. So we are taking a, the so we, are, we are doing some theoretical consideration before moving to the experiments. If you assume that this particular source, the plume source has some buoyancy flux, and if you do a volume flux analysis, uh, uh, if you do a volume flux control volume analysis, then, and if you know the initial buoyancy flux of the, of the, of the source, then you can actually derive the front velocity. You can derive a characteristic front velocity, which is dependent on B naught and H, which is the initial source height. You can also uh, derive a buoyancy jump, delta B. A1, A2 are the constants. And you can also derive what will be the current depth, H equal to H, which is a function of capital H. And the Richardson number and the Reynolds number of the flow can also be defined. So all of these can, is known to you because these are the initial conditions. So the Richardson number becomes a much more important criteria for understanding what, what is the necessary criteria for the ACP to act as a ramp for updraft, right? And that's exactly what we have done here. We have casted it in the form of three non-dimensional numbers. Reynolds number, since Reynolds numbers are quite high, that can drop off. And now we are going to find out updraft height and updraft velocity as a, um, uh, and we are going to create a criterion based on the Richardson number. So that's the theory. Now we move on to the experiments. We set up an experiment in a recirculating water tunnel, uh, which wherein only velocity measurement was done using PIV. We couldn't do PLIF because it was very, uh, in, I mean, the, the PLIF is little complicated. So we, we only focused on PIV because we wanted to measure the updraft height and updraft uh, velocity. So, the way it was set up was there is a there was a plume source which was it was a point plume source but we later on we can always change it to a distributed plume source but we started off with a point plume source uh, with a with a buoyancy flux B naught it hits the ground spreads as a gravity current and after it spreads some distance the mean ambient is turned on so the mean flow in the water tunnel is turned on and it will interact with the gravity current and different setup different parameters were uh, changed to see under what conditions the updraft happens and under what conditions the updraft doesn't happen. So these were the experimental parameters. In total, we had we varied the buoyancy flux, which is nothing but the initial delta rho of the um, in the in the in the uh, system, and we also changed the h, which is the source height. Of course, we cannot match the source heights present in the field experiment, so we had to kind of work with the non-dimensional numbers. So we worked in the range of Richardson number, which, which is two to 14, so low to high. 
and RE ranging from 700 to 1500. Each set of experiments was repeated three times and two different mean flow velocities were used. So the oncoming mean flow velocities, we, we had two different criteria. One of them is when the mean flow is equal to the frontal velocity. So what happens if the mean flow and the frontal velocity have the same magnitude? The second one is what if the mean flow has is much higher than the frontal velocity, right? So the frontal velocity is the velocity of the gravity current. So this particular uh, die, uh, qualitative die movie shows you that there is a plume coming down, it hits the bottom, there is a gravity current which is generated and at some point in time a mean flow will be switched on. As the mean flow is switched on, you will see that this particular yeah, so you can see that this ramp, this is acting as a ramp now and of course we have not dyed this particular part so you don't see the updraft but there is a potential for updraft here. One of the limitations of the experiment was that since the flow velocity is constantly from left to right, sorry or right to left, we had to switch off the cold, the, the plume at some point of time. That's why you can see after some time the, the plume, the entire stuff is moving to the left. But in reality what happens is the source is always present, right? So there is all the, the gravity current never dies down. But in our experiments we had to sh shut off the source so the gravity current dies, dies down after some time. But there is a momentary period in which we can record and confirm that there is an updraft or there is an overriding of the gravity current. So that was one of the limitations of experiments because, because the as the flow is switched on the plume will also keep moving along with it and that's not what happens in the field. In the field the, the source is sustained, yes. Uh, so if we have to do it then we only have to give the flow velocity only at the bottom but this is a water tunnel. So the water tunnel has the, yeah the whole way. So uh, but in, 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 in experiments what happens is there is a easterly wind at the bottom where there is a westerly wind at the top so it becomes stagnant. Uh, we could do that but it requires, I mean, so these experiments were little difficult to uh, do so that's why we didn't do it. But yeah, that's a great suggestion. That could be done, yeah. We can just move it along but then the location of the, the gravity current will change as we move this. So there were some experimental constraints but our idea was even, even though, it's, so within a span of small, I mean the, there is a small window where you can see the updraft and that's what we wanted to capture. And uh, prove the hypothesis that ACP can, can act as a ramp for the updraft uh, because if there is no thermal forcing, if only mechanical lifting is there, can this particular mechanism, uh, is this particular mechanism enough to take the parcel above the LFC? That's the, that's the question we are posing because LF, LFC, the level of reconversion requires that you have to lift it up to some, to some value. After that it becomes buoyant and it will do its own thermodynamics. Uh, so these are qualitative uh, plots, so there is the cold pool which is formed and then as soon as there is during the collision you, we see a significant updraft in all the three cases. Here it is not very clear but because the arrows are smaller but there is an uh, there is a updraft velocity which is seen and this post collision is basically the case when the, the plume is shut off and the it just overrides the entire um, uh, gravity current. So the, the gravity current is basically destroyed at this post collision but during collision is our, is the, is, is the main uh, focus for this particular work. So now we converted the qualitative plots into more quantitative plots. What, I, what we are showing here is uh, on, on, the left on the left panel is the vertical velocity V and the horizontal velocity U. So this basically is UF in some, in, um, this is basically the frontal velocity. So before the collision, so before we turn on the mean flow, you have this gravity current structure where the front is being captured. But as soon as the mean flow is turned on, then you see that the, the gravity current is moving along with the mean flow in both the cases. But the interesting part is this where you have uh, initially, you, so positive V is basically downdraft, negative V is updraft. So before the collision, uh, ideally speaking you shouldn't have any vertical velocity because everything is moving along with the, uh, everything should be horizontal but there are some fluctuations in entrainment which is, which is being uh, captured here. But as soon as we turn on the mean flow during collision there is an updraft which is seen in both the cases 
and as soon as we uh, after that it becomes because the reason it reduces in this blue is because the gravity uh, the plume is shut off so the gravity current is not there anymore so the updraft weakens but if you have a constant source of plume which is driving the gravity current then there is always going to be a negative velocity under certain circumstances so what is that circumstance under which updraft will happen and that's what we wanted to plot and we plotted all the richardson number onto one but uh, onto one graph and we can clearly see that there is a demarcation there is a critical value of richardson number which is 5 or 6 and that's what we term it as subcritical and supercritical there is there is absolutely no uh, vertical velocity and there is absolutely no updraft because this is hu by h so hu by h so h is the depth of the gravity current so hu should al always be greater than h Signific significantly greater than h small h so that the updraft is happening if hu and h are of the same order of magnitude which is close to 1 here that means there is no updraft so both these figures show that there is a critical value of richardson number which should be high so that updraft is seen which will lead to secondary cloud formation so now we went ahead and tested this in uh, the field experiment which is the one that i showed you before which was with the drop sonds the the flight drop sonds which measured the vertical structure of the atmosphere source height 5 kilometers cold pool height is 400 meters cold pool speed is 4 mean speed is 5 lfc for this particular case was 900 so for a cold pool to be triggered for this particular field data set you have to have updraft height which is greater than 900 and the richardson number in the field was calculated to be 0.1 using all these parameters which we have so from experiments we see that the maximum updraft is 1.4 times h and that happens when the mean flow is less than the front the frontal velocity of the gravity current and the maximum updraft that can happen is 0.25 into delta u and that happens when um is equal to uf so when um and uf are of the same order of magnitude that's when the updraft is is the maximum but then we wanted to convert that into an empirical correlation so now we'll focus on the richardson number uh, criteria here so according to the research richardson number criteria ri is less than ri critical because ri critical for us is around 5 which is pretty large but then it's it's still order of magnitude is close to 1 or 2 but here the order of magnitude is much smaller so that means that if you calculate the updraft velocity and updraft height from this particular correlation we see that the hu comes out to be 400 meters which is very which is similar to the cold pool height and the velocity is also very small it is not it is not significant sorry it should be 0.13 mm per second uh, i think i we made a mistake here it cannot be oh no it is 0.13 meters per second it's right uh, apologies so this is not enough to create any significant updraft is what is our conclusion so acp is not sufficient to to Uh, allow the parcel to breach the acp which is sorry breach the lc uh, lfc there should be lfc i'm sorry so you can see that the updraft height is same as same as the cold the cold pool height so it it is not triggering any updraft and in the field experiment all as well we didn't see any convective activity or we didn't we didn't see any secondary cloud formation in the uh, in the front in the in the front or rear of the main cloud system because the main cloud system the as the cold pool comes down there will be two gravity currents one moving rear and one moving front but on both the sides there was no uh, cold pool which was seen sorry there was no um, secondary cloud which was seen so the empirical correlations match with what is seen in the field experiments uh, hence we feel like this particular ric criteria is one of the main main triggers for understanding whether an updraft will happen or not So uh, just to summarize the initial source conditions are very critical for updraft during acp conditions because acp is which is atmospheric cold pools uh, are routinely seen in ocean as well as in the in the on the surface uh, of land uh, in, on the land as well but ocean acps are much more uh, much more of interest because we have documented many acps over oceans uh, at low values of ri there is no updraft because obviously the buoyancy is much larger uh, sorry much weaker than the shear so the shear just overrides which is exactly what we see here so we did now we did two experiments showing the updraft and no updraft at two different richardson numbers here you can see that 
we also now we dyed the the mean flow as well. So we can see there is some updraft here. Whereas here the mean flow is just kind of obliterating the gravity current as it moves. So the gravity current is simply getting vanished. Uh, so at high Richardson number, significantly high Richardson number, there is a chance that the updraft could happen and it, and it will break the LFC, which is the level of free convection. And that is should be set up by B naught H and delta U. The critical value is six from experiments. Of course, here we are only giving the order of magnitude. We don't want to say that six is the is like a holy number. It's just order of magnitude. Uh, and what we feel is that undercutting of cold air over warm air in the presence of mean flow is a probable mechanism for updrafts in the absence of any thermal forcing. So it's only a mechanical way of lifting your uh, air parcels to LFC and then triggering secondary cloud convection, which is what is a probable mechanism for those intense rainfall episodes which are seen in uh, observing in the in the field in the field campaigns. Uh, thank you. With this, I am happy to take any questions. All right, any questions for a speaker? We have time for a couple. Yeah. Or is it, I mean, you know, there's this big cloud, and you're, you know, you're sort of putting all this effort into understanding the little one next to it, right? And so uh, is that what you said at the end, that that's causing a lot of rain? What's the? Uh, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So the, the main thing is that, so as once these uh, once the main cloud system uh, uh, forms, it is uh, the the raindrop the raindrops evaporate and they create a cold pool. Yeah. Now that system is dissipating, okay. so that's like reached the it has reached the end of this life cycle. But now we assume we are saying that okay now there is no so the convection has happened, but there is not going to be any more new convective cells which are going to form. But then as the ACP forms, then they're not very close to the main system, but maybe few kilometers away from the main system. This, as the cold pool is moving, and if the mean flow and the cold pool have the right circumstances, then there is a secondary cloud because this is warm air which is getting uplifted, crosses the LFC, uh, and then condenses and forms a secondary and, cloud. And it's a, the secondary cloud is a a big meteorological event. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of rain associated. Yeah, with, oh, okay. uh, it is a lot of rain in a short period of time. So it it is like 70 millimeters per hour. Okay. Uh, comes out of nowhere so that's that that's one of the issues so this could also be related to thunderstorms if i may stretch it a bit but those that's what is so this is the probable mechanism for uh, the secondary clouds to form and give intense rains within a very short period of time do you think there's going to be uh, a lot of entrainment uh, at that front yeah so at the front there is going to be entrainment but then we have already passed that stage where the mean flow has hit so this is not entrainment this is that i understand so no the, the reason i ask is uh, uh, let's say you're trying to lift moist air uh, warm moist air and, and you're uh, you're entraining really cold dry air uh, entraining at the at the rear uh, no at, at the front itself so you have a gravity current that's cold and dry and you have a mean flow that's warm and moist uh, and at that front, as it's being uplifted, there is also mixing. Uh, so, does the LFC criteria really hold, or uh, because that that is mainly for adiabatic uh, ascent? Um, so, the LFC criteria is important because the thing, the, the 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 main premise is that there is no thermal activity at that point because it is the ground is cold. So, there is absolutely no uh, there is no thermal forcing. So now, what is the what is going to lift this warm air to the to break the LFC? No, what I mean is, uh, is the LFC a valid criterion? Because your the LFC is computed for uh, an air parcel of certain temperature and humidity, right. and that that air is continuously entraining really uh, opposite diametrically right. opposite. So, air. so we don't know what how important is entrainment. Let's say the gravity current is slow. Entrainment is not as active because the, the both the so there is a stagnation, right? So at the stagnation point, the entrainment is not as intense as. I mean, I can understand that if it was a strongly rotating flow, right? Then you have a difference. Yeah, but here rotation is of no use. I mean, exactly. So I mean, why would you expect entrainment to be small? No. So the entrain. I mean, so entrainment is happening at at the interface, but then the main the main the main point is that there is this gravity current which is acting as a ramp, and there are two counter rotating dipoles, right? So this particular mean flow or the mean flow, the warm air 
is so basically the acp cytokine has a ramp to lift it up mm -hmm. once it lifts up above the cold air then there is there is nothing there is no entrainment of cold air into the warm air and it has enough potential to reach break the lfc because lfc is the criteria for you to for the parcel to become buoyant and reach higher levels condense and start forming clouds so the we have not split the we have not um, kind of taken out the effect of entrainment but the important point here is can can the acp act as a ramp for this moisture to go mm -hmm. up uh, and do its job uh, thermodynamics aside can it do its job so we have not taken down on thermodynamics but the only idea is that is is it is it even possible for the for the acp to act as a ramp and lift this warm air upwards that's okay. that's the whole dynamical premise for this study because even that was not known before like i mean it was speculated but there was no set criteria or what is the what is the limiting factors okay it's time to move on but let's thanks rodar again thank you